This is my Bible. It is the Word of God, and it is the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am, seated in Christ Jesus, in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. As I'm taught the Word of God, my life is changed for the better, and I will never be the same again. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're still in this series, What Did Jesus Really Say? And if you have a Bible with you, we're going to pick up in Luke chapter 5. And the message this morning is a miraculous faith. Before we do the second miraculous catch of fish in John 21 from the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, I thought it might be best to go back and review the first miraculous catch of fish from the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. And the reason I want to do this is because I want you to see that it ended the way it began. And it began the way it ended. It was miraculous from the beginning to the end. Christianity was supposed to be from first to last a miraculous faith, not dead religion. The problem is the word becomes a living thing in us only as we act upon it. Tell your neighbor, the Word of God becomes a living thing in us only as we act upon it. Tell the neighbor on the other side, the Word of God becomes a living thing in us only as we act upon it. You see, believing the Word is acting on the Word. Too many of God's people acknowledge the truthfulness of the Word, but they never act upon the word, and hence the power never comes. Luke 5, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, from now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. I think One of the keys to my time in the ministry has been verse 5. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. And this is a lot of my ministry. I find people and that's what they would say to me. I worked my whole life, I haven't done anything. I I worked my whole life, I haven't accumulated anything. I've worked and worked and worked and I can't get ahead. We've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And you know, there are men, and, and they'll say that for a week. There are other men, and they'll say that for a month. There are other men, and they'll say that for a year or two, because you say so. But then there are men, and they, they can't go the distance. Or they come up to a level of blessing, and they say, good enough. And that's it. That's all they can go. That's the distance. But that's the juice, man, because you say so. Because you say so, 
I will take action on your word. Peter's boat was his seed, faith, giving. He gave his boat first to Jesus, who used it for preaching the gospel. Then Jesus gave it back, saying, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Jesus was saying, I intend to multiply your giving by filling this empty boat with a record catch of fish. Just launch out into the deep, throw your nets over, and I will do the rest. Now, Peter was a commercial fisherman. Peter fished for a living in order to support his family. He understood Jesus' language about the deep. Peter knew that is where the biggest fish were. What Peter did not know was the principle of giving as the planting of a seed or seed giving. Peter did not yet understand the principle <clears throat> of seed faith giving. That seed given in faith is the only thing that God can multiply back into your life. Peter's boat was empty. His nets were worn. He and his partners were discouraged. He said to Jesus, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. A hard worker? Doubtlessly, yes, because who would work all night? You sure couldn't get anybody in this generation to work all night. A man with a financial need? Yes. A man occupied with the futility of his own efforts? Yes. Peter had not yet realized that Jesus was the Son of God and was introducing a new way of life for the people of God to enjoy. Jesus had come to fulfill the law of Moses and the Old Testament and to give his blood in a new testament or a new covenant that each believer might have life and that they might have that life more abundantly. Peter knew about tithing. All good Jews tithe. They gave an exact 10% of what they had earned to God. The tithe is, in effect, a payment due, a 10% thanksgiving after the money is earned. Tithing is a seed owed. Tithing is not a seed given. It is a seed owed. It is a seed sowed, but it is not a seed given. Peter doubtless was a tither and knew that the tithe was the 10% he owed on all of his income. But still Peter had been missing the benefits of seed faith giving. You know, God revealed his intention in the beginning. He said to Abraham, I will bless you and I will make you a blessing. It's all through the Psalms. It's all through the Proverbs. But they never got it. They never got it. And even though as a culture they were blessed, they never got the other side of being blessed, and that is being a blessing. Peter had been missing the benefits of seed faith giving. His boat was empty. His nets were worn. And his partners were discouraged. Peter said to Jesus, Master, we have worked hard all night and have caught nothing. Say it out loud. I'm going to dare to give God my best, and then I'm going to believe God for his best. Now, that's me. And I know people get offended at it, but you have to understand my perspective. I haven't paid too big a price for people being offended. I just keep trucking. Amen. 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 I'm not believing God for a 2010 Volvo. Amen. I'm not believing God for leftovers. Amen. I'm not believing God for a house that's changed hands eight times. When we were looking for land, we went and looked at a place that had been a Johnson & Johnson factory. And uh, 
We, we did a tour of the property, did a tour of the building, and one of the ladies with me, one of the ladies in management back in those days said, what do you think? And I said, well, if they gave it to me, I wouldn't take it. <laughs> and she said, why not? I said, well, it's a sow's ear, and I can't turn it into a silk purse. And not only that, it was a factory. Watch it now. It was a factory and I don't know what kind of chemicals they used, and I don't know what kind of uh, stuff is buried out back. And I said, we are talking about building a private Christian school, and we are talking about God's children. Amen. If they gave it to me, I wouldn't take it. Amen. It'd take millions just to tear it down, and then I wouldn't have confidence about the dirt. She said, well, what do you want? I said, I want, I want farmland. Amen. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters in the Lord, God will meet you at whatever level you can believe him at. Amen. If you can believe him for a tote the note, then a tote the note you'll be driving. Amen. If you can believe him for some uh, pre-certified, then pre-certified is what you'll be driving. But if you can believe for new, then new is what you'll be driving. Amen. Say it out loud. Everybody shout it like thunder. My great father, My great father will, meet me will meet me at whatever level, whatever level I can believe him at. Amen. Amen. Say it again. I'm going to dare to give God my best, and then I'm going to believe God for his best. Amen. You know, I'm a fanatic on it. People get offended. I remember once some guy that worked for me asked me what kind of golf clubs I had. I said the best. You know, he's all offended. But the best to me, any, any thinking person knows, the best to me in something very personal like that is not the best to the next guy. It's personal. So there's no point getting offended at it. I mean, you know, that's retarded. I know we're not supposed to use that word anymore, but that's retarded. If somebody asked me what kind of running shoes I should I wear, I'd say, well, the best. They're the best for me. They're actually a kind that Chris Stewart recommended years ago. He saw me walking in prayer. He said, you need X, Y, Z. And so that's what I started buying. And they, sure enough, you know, they felt better. But that doesn't mean that's the best for the next guy. God's not going to demand you buy the blue Ford or the red Chevrolet. But he will meet you at whatever level you believe him at for what you want. For, I said for what you want. Amen. I'm not believing God for a ticket on Greyhound. Amen. Part of why Jesus had come was to bring an entirely, say it out loud, an entirely, entirely different, different way, way of, giving, of giving, which would lead to, say it, an entirely different way of living. If a man would freely enter into it, it would bring forth an abundant harvest of multiplied return. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. This is summed up in Hebrews 6.14, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. Saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. That's the one I serve. I don't know who everybody else is serving. That's the one I serve. Amen. I go into his presence Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning. It doesn't matter. I walk in there and I hear, surely, blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. Hallelujah. When Jesus asked Peter to give his boat, Jesus knew the boat was empty and the nets were worn. Jesus knew business was bad and the 
Peter's family was in need. Jesus understood that Peter was discouraged from toiling all night with no tangible results. But Jesus knew something else too. Jesus knew that he had come to bring men like Peter life and to bring that life more abundantly. Jesus knew that he had come to show Peter how to multiply his efforts. Jesus had come to show Peter how to generate fruit with New Testament anointing on him. Look at John 10, 10. Jesus said, I have come that they might have. Say it out loud. I, Jesus came that I might have. So why do so many then preach a gospel of doing without? A gospel of not having. Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, but I have come that they might have life and that they might have life more abundantly. That's what I'm preaching here. Life more abundantly. I said, that's what I'm preaching here. Life more abundantly. Amen. I have come that you may have. I am come that you may have life and that you might have it more abundantly. When his own disciples wanted to incite a riot and have a certain city burned to the ground, Jesus said to them in Luke 9, 56, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. So if there's any stealing or killing or destroying going on, I don't need to offend God by asking God if that's his will for my life. I know from John 10, 10, if there's any stealing or killing or destroying going on, that's not the work of God, that's the work of Satan. And I have every right to stand up and resist it and to rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Because he came that I might have life. The Bible says in James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In other words, he's not capricious. He doesn't wake up one day and change his mind from the next day. He changes not. And to the children of God, the apostle John wrote in 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. That is the will of God for your life. Paul wrote in Philippians 4.19, My God shall supply all of your need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. So everywhere you look in the new covenant, you see that Jesus has come that we might have. Jesus has come that we might experience life more abundantly. Jesus demonstrated abundant life to all he met. Jesus taught in terms of meeting the needs of the people he met, healing their sicknesses and diseases, restoring them, un restoring unto them that which had been taken from them and setting them free from every demonic influence and oppression. And notice that it was Jesus' habit to meet people at the point of their needs. They had toiled all night and had caught no fish. So he didn't bring them a gold coin. He didn't show up with a healing. In other words, Jesus would meet people at their point of need. Peter's need that morning was they had worked hard all night and had caught nothing. And that's what he did. He went from town to town and village to village, and he met people at their need. Someone's blind, he meets them there. Someone's lame, he meets them there. Someone had leprosy, he met them there. Someone was a demoniac in chains in the tombs, he met them there. Wherever he found them, he met them at their point of need. And that's how he got their attention. In getting ready to bless them or to multiply his blessings back to them, Jesus would typically ask the people to do something first. Jesus knew Peter's boat was empty. There at the Sea of Galilee, Jesus was concerned with the large crowds pressing in upon him. Jesus cared about them and he cared about their needs. And that's why he wanted Peter's boat in the first place. He knew that Peter's boat would be a good place, a pulpit, as it were, from which he could speak and the people could see him. But God will be no man's debtor. 
And when, Je when Jesus asked to borrow the boat, before he asked to borrow the boat, he had in mind a way to give back and to make it up to Peter. I was 18 years old and I sat there in Jerry's restaurant at Beachmont and Salem Avenues in Cincinnati, Ohio, actually Anderson Township. And I told my father I was not going to go back to Miami University. I was going to go to Central Bible College and I was going to go into the ministry. I was going to obey the call of God. I was going to preach the gospel. And he sat there and he told his only child that I would, I, he was going to cut me off. He was going to write me out of his will. He, I would never be anything. I would never have anything. I would never go anywhere. And he prophesied over my life. And I didn't know all of this then. But thank God, thank God, thank God, my steps were ordered of the Lord, and I came across great fathers in the faith who taught me. They taught me. And thank God, thank God, thank God, I had eyes to see and ears to hear, and I was not obtuse. And I saw... That if I would live the new way Jesus taught, following him would cost me nothing. I saw that if I would live the new way Jesus taught, the price would be nothing. I saw that if I would live the new way Jesus taught, that I would have life and that I would have life more abundantly. Now in real time, there's cost. In real time, there's cost. But you let time go by and you let him multiply what you put in his hands and over time there is no cost whatsoever. The unbeliever cannot see this. But Jesus had equal concern for Peter and his partners in the fishing business because that's who they were. They were fishermen. He cared about them and their needs, which meant their business. Jesus knew that their boat was empty, even though they had labored all night. Their empty boat interested Jesus. Your empty bank account interests Jesus. Your empty, lonely heart interests Jesus. If you're here this morning with a growth on your body, that interests Jesus. Because he shows up where you have a need. Any barren womb in the place that interests Jesus. Because that is who he is. All of our needs are a kind of a death. And Jesus is not a kind of life. He is life. And whether it is an empty bank account or whether it is a barren womb or whether it is a growth on a body, when Jesus shows up, when life touches death, life wins out. Jesus sees things differently than we do. You see a need. You see a shortage. Jesus sees an opportunity to supply by means of a miracle. Most people today look at their needs and they become negative. Often they say, why? Why has this happened to me? What have I done to deserve this? But Jesus looks on every need in a positive way. To Jesus, a need exists to be met. To Jesus, a need is an opportunity to show out in someone's life. 
Say it again. I'm going to dare to give God my best, and then I'm going to believe God for His best. To Jesus, a need in your life is not something to discourage you and make you negative. To Jesus, a need in your life is a legitimate claim you have upon His limitlessly limitless resources to be met in full and prove his word is good in your life provided you plant a seed first. Look again at what God's word says in Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now the word shall is a strong word in the English language. In other words, the moment your need faces you, God's shall supply promise goes into effect. Sue and I learned many years ago to not fear a vacuum. Somebody quits, don't fear it. Somebody leaves, don't fear it. There's a void, don't fear it. Because we serve the God that meets us at our point of need. There is something you need to know and get positive about. No need should intimidate you or bully you. If Christ is first in your life and you are giving to him, then you are in connection with the life of God. You are plugged in. God is answering and you should be expecting. And what a difference that makes in your attitude. In other words, the moment your need faces you, and you have been practicing giving and receiving, God's shall supply promise goes into effect. God's word talks about giving and receiving. Philippians 4, 15. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches. That's verse 19. Verse 15 talks about giving and receiving. This is something you need to know and get positive about. No need should intimidate you or bully you. If Christ is first in your life and you are giving to him, you are in connection, you're plugged in. As we conclude, let us review the three principles of seed faith giving. In all the references to giving in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation, there are three things we find in common. One, God is the source of your supply. Say it out loud, God is the source of my supply. Number two, whatever you give, give it as seed faith. Say it out loud. God wants to be first in my life and in my giving. Whatever I give, I give it as seed faith. And third, when you give, expect a miracle. And I'm telling you, this is where we miss it. And the reason we miss it right here a lot of times is because of prejudices that we picked up other places. And a lot of cliches and prejudices are moronic. You ought not give to get. Oh my God, that is the dumbest thing to ever come out of any human being's mouth. Every farmer knows there's only one reason to sow a seed, and that is to get a harvest. So I don't care whether you got a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a PhD, you ought to at least get to be as smart as a farmer. Every farmer sows a seed to get. Would you like to know how I say it every day of my life? Yes. Say this, because God is my source, and because I have seed faith in the ground, above and beyond the tithe, I have a seed faith miracle harvest coming today and every day from this day to my last day. You want to hear it again? Because God is my source. And because I have seed faith in the ground, above and beyond the tithe, I have a seed faith miracle harvest coming today and every day, from this day to my last day. Now watch it now. Do I really 
actually receive a miracle every day? Not yet. But I do expect a miracle every day. That's where we've missed it. And since I made this one adjustment in my attitude of faith and in my daily confession back in October, I have received 31 specific miracles since. That's why giving, that's why tithing religiously doesn't work as well. Because you don't have your expector turned on. Any of you ladies that have a garden, if you plant tomato seeds, what do you expect to see? You expect to see by and by some green things shoot out of the earth. You expect to see by and by a vine. And then you expect to see by and by uh, little green hard things that will evolve into big, red, fat, juicy things. And inside of every tomato is what? More seed. So you can do it again. Now, who designed that system in the earth? Then why is it such a stretch to think that maybe he put the same system in the earth financially? Yeah, but I gave and I didn't get. Well, that's because you gave it to your brother-in-law. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life. I have come that you might have. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So when you give, expect God to use it to further his gospel and also to multiply back into your life in the form of meeting your needs and empowering you to reach your faith goals. We see these three principles in Jesus dealing with Peter and his friends. These men were not accustomed to looking God as their supply, their source in the fishing business. Instead, they looked to themselves, to their own knowledge and experience, and to their own efforts. Although doubtless they were tithers, paying one-tenth of what they had already earned, what they owed God as the owner of all the earth, they had not understood Jesus' way of giving above and beyond the tithe in the New Testament, which is found in Luke 6, 38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. As fishermen, they had observed the law of seed time and harvest all around them, but they had never applied it to the relationship of their giving to God, giving and receiving to and from the Lord. Seed faith giving is sowing and reaping. Say it out loud. Seed faith giving, Seed faith giving is sowing, sowing and, reaping. and reaping. Now when we say it again, emphasize and. Seed faith giving, Seed faith giving is, sowing is sowing and reaping. And reaping. So you can't leave out the reaping part. The farmer who wants a crop first gives seeds to the earth. The seed and the ground belong to each other. In the same way, you and your giving, along with God, belong to each other. It is in this interaction that the seed is multiplied. As Pastor Sue is constantly telling me, when you give a thing to God, it cannot remain small. Jesus said in Matthew 17, 20, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. If a farmer has a tiny little mustard seed, it only remains small if he doesn't plant it. But if that farmer plants even that tiniest of seeds, it will grow into a large tree. When you give a thing to God, it cannot remain small. The first thing Jesus did was to help them get their eyes off the problem. He did this by asking them to do something for him, to give their boat for a little while to use in his work. This is the me generation, and this is the do-nothing generation, and this is the sissy generation. And this is the crybaby generation. When you give a thing to God, 
in that moment, you get your eyes off of yourself. Jesus had the fishermen do something first to give him something of themselves. In this instance, their boat. So they would start looking to him as the source of their supply. At that moment, he applied the third key principle. Launch out into the deep and make your catch. He was saying there is a certain depth where the multiplying of your seed faith giving starts. I know where the depth is. It is beyond the level of your old thoughts and practices of building your life pattern around yourselves. Now this is blinding revelation. And if you get it, you're going to double and quadruple your income in the next few years. He was saying there is a certain depth where the multiplying of your seed faith giving starts. And he was saying, I know where the depth is. It is beyond the level of your old thoughts and practices of building your life pattern around yourself. It's going beyond self to God, to that point where he is first in your life, where you give him your best, then you ask him for his best. That is where your miracle begins at your depth. That is where your miracle begins at your depth. And the reason people do not make progress financially and the reason people do not change levels financially is because they find a depth and it works for them and they stay at that depth. But your depth in 2005 was not your depth in 2010. And your depth in 2010 was not your depth in 2015. And your depth in 2015 is not your depth this morning. But if you're still doing, if you're still fishing at your depth back in 2010, then that's why you have never graduated beyond the prosperity level of 2010. A lot of Christians are like my father-in-law. When we got married and we came up to my first birthday, my first birthday, December of 1976, I got a complimentary C-note in the mail. Fast forward 41 years, when I got to my birthday, December of 2017, I got a complimentary C-note in the mail. Every time one of those envelopes came, I would tease Pastor Sue and I'd say, has the dude never heard about inflation? <laughs> but that's the way God's people are. They gave $1,000 in a challenge offering in 1995, and man, they got a 30-fold return or a 60-fold return or a 100-fold return, and they, they thought, man, $1,000 is the juice, brother. You're not even as smart as people in Vegas. If something's working, you work it more. You don't work it the same. I've had two different men come to me in the last 10 years and they say, Pastor, I just picked a number out of my head. I just picked a number. It was 5,000, I think, on both of them. I just picked a number and, uh, and, and I sowed a seed and I believed God for $5,000 and I got it. And I've never heard from either of them since. I'm a thinking man. Man, if they work for five grand the way Pastor Gene thinks, I'd be thinking, let's do 50. Amen. 
But a lot of folks, if they had been Peter, a lot of folks, they'd have taken all that fish, they'd have put all that fish in the freezer, and they would have retired, and, and they would have eaten a little bit of fish every day until the fish ran out, and then they would have gone back looking for Jesus, but he would have been crucified, buried, resurrected in heaven, and they wouldn't know what to do now. But I learned from my daddy, Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, if you can identify the principle in the Word of God, you can work the principle over and over and over and over again. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this explains why in the lives of so many, giving and receiving works for a while, then the power of it seems to wane because God's people think last year's depth is their depth for life. I mean, I'm telling you, when I stood up here Easter, in, in my mind, I mean, just to commit a million dollars, I didn't have a million dollars on hand that I could get my hands on, and so I'm having to believe it in and work it off, and, and you know, but I'm in it now. I said, I'm in it now. And the next time I give a million dollars, ain't no gonna be no working it off, ain't gonna be no, you know, uh, weeks on end and months on end, ain't gonna be no confessing, ain't gonna be no believing, ain't, I'm gonna write a check. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, I remember the fifth grade. I remember my fifth grade teacher. It was my favorite teacher. It was a guy who was the toughest teacher I had in elementary school. But I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm not there. Amen. Same thing's true financially. I remember my first house. I liked it. But would I go back? No. Would I want to be there today? No. My second house, third house, fourth house, they were all nice, and they were all a step up. Do I want to go back? No. Do I want to downsize? No. Amen. Yeah, but you could have lower overhead. Well, the one I'm serving, I don't need lower overhead. Amen. Well, that's more to take care of. Well, I'm helping the economy because I'm not doing any of it. I just hire people to do whatever, and then I believe the money in, and here it comes. So I'm a contributor to the economy. The two main things we got out of the August week of increase, or I did, on mastering money were God's system of economics is designed to literally cost the believer nothing. If you have cost in your mind when you pray and you ask God what to do, you are not ready for another level. There is no cost. There is no cost. But in real time, there's cost. But there is no cost. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. When I sat there at 18 years of age and my father cut me off and, and, and said, you know, I paid for the first year at Miami University, but not one more dime. And I was 18 years old. The words were withering. You're going to be poor. I took years for God to knock that mental image out of my head. Because fathers have authority when they speak to their children. In real time, there was cost. But over time, there is no cost. And the second principle is, there's no end to the blessing if we would just do what God said do. But that we don't want to do what God said do in 2018. We want to do what God said do in 2010. And what God says do this year may not be the same as what God said do last year. There is a certain depth in your giving. What you must, what, what you give must represent you where you are right now in your life. 
That's why you've heard me say, you know, a man making a quarter of a million a year, are you telling me he should just tithe? Are you kidding me? A man making a half a million a year, are you saying he, we, he, you want me to believe he should just tithe? Are you kidding me? Moses taught it this way, that we are to give to God in proportion to the way the Lord our God has blessed us. You cannot compromise your depth or what you give. You must give it first. And when you do, it is a great moment in your life. For now, Jesus is at the helm of your boat. He is in control of your life. And he is directing you to where the supply is. Peter said with enthusiasm, at your word, Lord, I will let down the nets. In our language today, he was saying, Lord, I'll do it, and I'll expect a miracle. And I want you to see them now in your mind's eye. No longer are their eyes on the problem. They are looking to him. The boat they had given to him has been used to help others. Now Jesus has restored it back to them and is on his way to multiplying it back, this time full and overflowing with fish, which they will sell to meet the needs of their families. They are expectant. They know something good is about to happen to them. Now the command is given. Here is your depth. Throw the net over. Jesus' voice is positive. His words electric. Eager hands throw the net over. It settles into the water. Hungry fish strike it. Hands tighten. Pull in the net. The voice of the master speaks again. The fishermen pull and strain. In the net is their seed, faith, giving, multiplied. Fish by the hundreds, big ones, little ones, all kinds of fish jumping and leaping. Now they haul the net in, but it's too full, and the cords begin to break, and the boat begins to sink. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters in the Lord, from 2018 forward, Faith Christian Center is going to walk in net breaking, boat sinking, abundance and prosperity. The men cry out, it's too much for the boat. Look out, we're going to sink. Concerned with the catch or the harvest, they call for the other hands, other boats, and they are also filled. It's like that story in the Old Testament. Every jar the widow gathered up was filled with oil. <clears throat> then it dawned on them, this man had done what he taught. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. So what does this mean to you today? In reflecting on this encounter with the needs of these men and what Jesus directed them to do, notice that he asked them to go one more time. In the PMA world, it's what they call going the second mile. Well, I'm tired. I'm worn out. I tried that. Well, just go one more time. Amen. Try again. And this time look to him as your source and expect a miracle, a miracle catch. And what if they had not tried that second time? He told them there was a certain depth for them. And at that point, their miracle would begin. This is giving of yourself your time your talent, your effort, your money, your love, your patience, your determination, and your faith. It is seed that you give to God like the farmer gives the seed to the earth. He told them to let down their nets for a catch. Their minds had been on failure. <clears throat> Jesus' mind was on success. Their minds had been on catching nothing. His mind was on a miraculous catch. Their minds were on how they'd worked all night and caught nothing. His mind was on the limitless resources of his father. He knew there was plenty. They were in the midst of it. All they had to do is change on the inside and open themselves up and begin giving to God, and begin to expect a miracle. There is no shortage of God's resources. There is no shortage in the earth, none whatsoever. There is only a shortage of faith and in our understanding of the goodness of God. Stop doubting the power of your own faith in God and release your faith 
by planting seeds of faith. And God will show you plenty. And stop trying to get more faith. Instead, release the faith you've got. Look for ways to release the faith you've got. And then your faith will grow. Just like a muscle. After they did something first, it set in motion the power that transformed them from nothing to something, from zero to everything. And it changed the direction in which they had been looking. Now they saw not the problem, but the Lord, humbled at his great concern for them, grateful for this tremendous act supplying all of their needs. They saw what they needed most, a continual relationship with the Lord Jesus being first. Peter said, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Today a man might not use those words. Uh, today a man might say, Lord, I've messed up my life. I don't feel worthy to call you my Lord. I, I don't even feel worthy to ask for your help. Today Jesus is saying, because you know in your heart that you can't run your own life, and you finally turned it over to me, I will change you into the person who will be part of the answer instead of part of the problem. And I will put you in position to get your needs met and more than your needs met so you can be a blessing to others. In this way, you'll know real life. You'll know abundant life. And you'll be able to live life abundantly. <coughs> Remember, seed faith giving is rooted in God, in the seed that you plant unto him. And, and in the solid feeling you gain in the inner man knowing that he is going to give a miracle and he will give it at the right time. It leads to a sense of abandon. I guess I gotta warn you, it leads to a sense of abandon. And it leads to a kind of fearlessness. There are no shortcuts, no easy answers. There are no exemptions from needs and problems. But seed faith giving works when? With simple, sincere faith in God, you work it by regularly planting seeds of faith. Christianity was supposed to be, from first to last, a miraculous faith. Not a dead religion. The problem is the word becomes a living thing in us only as we act upon it. Believing the word is acting on the word. Too many of God's people acknowledge the truthfulness of the word, but they never act on the word. The truthfulness of the word. They never take action on the word. Say it out loud. I'm going to dare to give God my best, and I'm going to believe God for his best. Say it out loud. God is my source, so I'm going to give so that it will be given to me. And after my seed is in the ground, I'm going to believe God for my harvest. Now, I know people, you know, I see new people here. They might be thinking, well, you know, he's fundraising. He's got a special offering coming up next Sunday. Well, this is way beyond that. We're looking for ways to give. We're looking for ways to sow. And it's not just the challenge offering. I mean, when there's a special guest here, when we hear about a crusade somewhere and we'd like to have a piece of that, we're constantly looking for ways to give, to be a blessing. It's a lifestyle. And it's a lifestyle. I mean, why... Would the number one complaint that I've heard over 45 years of preaching the word of God be the tithe if the tithe weren't a primary gateway to the abundant life Jesus promised? Satan doesn't put up any opposition about women wearing no makeup in those chandelier swinging churches. <clears throat> because it doesn't matter. Those churches, those Pentecostal churches where they measure women's skirt lengths, there's, Satan's going to have no opposition against that because that doesn't mean anything. 
the only place or point he is going to put up an opposition is at a point of power. And we never saw it. Tithing is not the end, it's the beginning. And I'm not going to give you any examples. I'm tempted to, but I'm not going to because people would say we're bragging on ourselves. But Sue and I are constantly, constantly, constantly giving, 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 giving. Constantly giving to the poor. Constantly giving food away. Constantly giving clothes away. Constantly giving. It's a lifestyle. It's not fundraising. It's a lifestyle. And once you begin to walk in it, you begin to realize we've missed the whole boat. Everybody's need is not financial. But where there are financial needs, Jesus wants to meet them at that point. And his voice has been diminished and his witness has been dimmed because his people never got the vision. That whatever they gave away in his name, he would not only replace it, he'd multiply it. So I can give with abandon. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And his life. He came that we might have. 